So I'm Marian Murray at Utah State University Integrated Pest Management Program. And I decided to cover this topic, what to manage, ignore, or what's impossible, because you know, sometimes it's hard to figure out what to do when you encounter a pest. And what I'm gonna present on is really just guidelines or general uh, ways to look at these different pests. Um, some of them really should be managed uh, when they are encountered. Some of them could be ignored. Um, and some of them are, um, there's no real cure for them. So they're impossible to fix with any kind of fungicide. Um, and so I just want you to keep in mind as I go through this that all pests, whether an insect problem or disease problem, they are cyclical. So one year they may be bad, but that doesn't mean the next year they'll even be around at all. Uh, so they may be cyclical from year to year and also uh, from plant to plant and from one property to the next. So again, this is just a guideline. It's not uh, hard and fast. So for pests to, to manage, I'm gonna cover uh, about five different groups. And the first one is anthracnose. And um, there are several fungal species that cause anthracnose. In Utah, we typically see it on sycamore, oak, and maple. Now the two pictures shown on the bottom here is anthracnose on maple on the right and on oak on the left. But for this topic of pests to manage, I really wanted to focus on sycamore um, because with sycamore, and I'll explain why, but the anthracnose can be a yearly problem, year to year. Um, and it can also, as trees are affected every year, it can make them more susceptible to other problems. So you may have seen sycamore London plane tree with a branching habit like this. And that is typical of anthracnose because the pathogen is killing the terminal foliage and the buds. And then you get new buds on the sides of those twigs coming out. So we call this witch's brooming. So on sycamore, anthracnose is considered to be like a systemic problem. Once the tree has it, it typically um, is there for the duration. And it really just depends on the climate on whether infection shows up from year to year. So it overwinters on the twigs in these infected areas uh, that have spores and the spores are released in spring and the leaves come out and then that foliage becomes infected and it will drop and new foliage will uh, emerge or, or leaf out in its place. So with anthracnose of any trees, um, the infections will stop once temperatures warm above 80 degrees and then it's done. There's no more new infections that happen. But there have been years where we have had severe, uh, cool, wet spring conditions, and that's conducive to anthracnose, um, especially on sycamore. And we get results like this, where most of the tree, the foliage on the trees is affected, most of the foliage drops and the trees leaf out. And so you can see if you have this continual pattern year to year, that the trees will become uh, less vigorous. So uh, again, this disease is weather dependent, needs cool rainy conditions during the leaf expansion time. Um, but again, once the temperatures reach 80 for about two to three days or so, uh, the fungus development. All right, so managing anthracnose on sycamore in particular um, is to be done in two ways. So, and really it's, I, for this presentation, I'm gonna talk about some non-chemical options and chemical options. Um, but for anthracnose, uh, it's especially sycamore, it's really, you need to kind of think about a chemical application. Anyway, so it could be foliar and that timing would be when the leaves just start emerging. So that's called bud break. First application we apply then, and then the second application two weeks later. And so I've listed some options here. And, and if you're a homeowner, you would probably want to get a professional to do this. And the second option is the same. You'd want to have a professional do a uh, uh, injection into the tree. So uh, we have um, 
couple of options that are available and the timing is in fall and the treatment lasts about two years. So it's highly effective, somewhat expensive, but you have those um, specimen trees you wanna preserve, then this would be the route I would recommend taking. Okay, so we're still on our list of managing uh, pests to manage and we've got borers and bark beetles. So this is a mix of uh, dozens and dozens of pests in um, the families of beetles, moths, and wasps. So I'm just kind of grouping all of these together. Um, and they often have similar life cycles where they overwinter inside the tree as a larva. And then in the spring, they will pupate in the tree and then emerge as the adult to fly and mate. And then the females lay eggs on the bark of their host trees. Uh, and then the larvae hatch and go inside the tree for the rest of the summer. So it's kind of the basic life cycle of borers and bark beetles. Um, but the thing to remember is that most of these species will typically only attack trees that are already under some kind of stress. And so this is a common question if you're um, a landscape, uh, you have a landscape business, I bet it's a common question that you get um, I have borers, how do I treat them? Uh, you wanna start with the underlying cause. Uh, the tree was under some kind of stress that brought the borers to the tree. So why would you manage? Well, in the end, they could potentially kill the trees um, or they could result in failure of say a branch falling down and maybe causing some damage. So some examples of these borers and bark beetles, one is our flathead borers. These are um, beetles and the adults, sometimes they have a common name of metallic bark beetle, um, but the larvae shown on the left, they have that flattened head. The exit holes that's shown in these two pictures are large. So if you have a tree with large exit holes that are oval shaped or maybe kind of a D shape, then you might uh, consider the fact that it's flat-headed borers. There's a couple of different species. And they feed right under the bark in kind of this meandering serpentine pattern. Um, so if you ever had a tree with some bark flake off and you found this type of pattern of a gallery of whom they're feeding, that's the flat-headed borers. And this is one of the pests that can cause trees to fail. So they don't necessarily kill the tree outright, but they certainly weaken the wood. Another um, borer that I threw in here is Sequoia pitch moth. It's a little different from the regu regular regular um, borers and bark beetles in that it really feeds on the um, bark, the outside of the tree. It doesn't go into the tree very far. Um, it often goes to pruning cuts and it causes these large masses of pitch. And at this time of year, if you find these masses of pitch, you can pull it off and maybe find a, a caterpillar underneath. It's actually a, a moth. And then the final example in this group are bark beetles. So if you go hiking in the woods, I'm sure you've seen um, the devastation that bark beetles have done with our forest trees, spruces, firs, and pines. So they're teeny, teeny, tiny insects, and they are often identified by the host, but also by this feeding gallery under the bark uh, where the female feeds to lay her eggs, and then the larvae feed off to the side of that female's uh, adult gallery. But we can't, there are some bark beetle species that do uh, attack particularly spruce trees in our ornamental landscapes. Um, so we have seen certainly plenty of this. It's not just in the mountains where we see the bark beetles. The exit holes. Uh, so I remember I showed you the flat-headed borer exit holes. Well, the bark beetle exit holes are perfectly round and about a third the size. They often might be associated with some sawdust-like frass around the base of the tree or with uh, some pitch 
or uh, ooze coming out from the tree to try and push out the larvae that are feeding in the tree. So managing this group of insects, um, I mentioned stressed trees are most susceptible. So you would definitely wanna start with ways you can improve the health of the tree. And if you have a tree growing in the middle of turf areas, you can imagine that competition for ear, water and nutrients um, is there between the tree roots and the turf roots. So removing the turf from around the tree will help prevent that competition and just providing optimal irrigation. Uh, just those two things can do a lot of help for trees. Uh, but if chemicals are needed, the um, recommendation is insecticide trunk spray. So it would be applied during the flight period. So you would need to know, and we could help you figure out what bore species it is when it's flying and when you would need to make that application. Uh, carbaryl, permethrin are the two that are most effective and provide the longest protection. And I often get questions about, well, I just wanna use systemic because um, it would be so much easier, but the systemics actually do not work on the majority of the bark beetles and the borers, except those flat-headed borers that I mentioned um, that are feeding right under the bark. Those are the only ones that uh, it would work on. And an example is if you've heard of emerald ash borer, which is not in Utah, is one, but bronze birch borer is another, and then our other, some other flat-headed borer species. So there's a question of flat-headed borers, do they ever move into the roots? And the answer is no. So they're only feeding um, above ground. All right, so still on pests to manage. So powdery mildew, and I imagine this is one that most of you know, you're familiar with. It's the, um, the mycelium, the white mycelium, the fungus itself growing on the surface of the leaf and pulling out the nutrients it needs. Um, but it's preventing the leaves from photosynthesizing. So there's about 300 uh, host plants that can be affected by powdery mildew. And one thing uh, you may not be familiar with is that there's actually almost as many fungal species that cause powdery mildew, and most of them are specific to a certain host. Like if you have a lilac that has powdery mildew and then next to it, you have a honeysuckle, um, that powdery mildew from the lilac will not spread. To that honeysuckle, um, it may be some different powdery mildew fungus that attacks it. So why would you manage powdery mildew? Well, it's typically an annual problem. Once a plant has been affected by it, um, the uh, presence of the pathogen is there. And also um, it can, the spores, which I'll show in a sec, can spread for a few miles in, in the air from neighboring plants. Um, it does disrupt photosynthesis for the plant itself and for plants that are kind of marginally hardy, if they're getting powdery mildew constantly, it may reduce cold hardiness. So a couple of Q&A questions I just wanna see. All right, so I will address those later. Uh, examples of powdery mildew on woody plants, um, just to show you the range of hosts, we've got apple on the top left, crab apple as well, horse chestnut in the middle, dogwood on the top right, Norway maple on the lower left, rose, the common host of powdery mildew, and then um, ornamental pear on the lower right. So powdery mildew overwinters as what are called fruiting bodies uh, that form on the foliage or they can be um, attached to the bark as well. It can also overwinter as another structure, the mycelium on the bark or on the twigs. So two different ways, it can be on the leaves that fall to the ground or it can be on the tree uh, or twigs itself. So depending on where it's overwintering, that will depend on, oh, that will determine when infections happen in the spring. So if it's a plant where it overwinters on 
the twigs, like the mycelium infections will happen right when leaves emerge. Otherwise, infections don't usually happen for about a month later. Uh, but anyway, it's one, uh, the fungus is act active all season long. Infections can happen um, anytime through the end of the season and really just cover the, the whole part of the plant. Moisture, rain is not needed. It's really just the humidity within the plant canopy itself is all that's needed to contribute to additional infections. So I do see a Q&A question I will address now um, as I was just talking about it from Joseph, is injection advised for bark beetle? And that answer is no. So I assume by injection, you mean a systemic insecticide and um, all of the systemics that are available have been tested for bark beetles and they are actually not effective. So unfortunately it's just that trunk spray um, that would be the options. And that's why it is more difficult to manage. All right, so managing powdery mildew, um, cultural options is first, you wanna make sure that you have found those new infections that uh, happen on the foliage. And typically it's gonna be the foliage that's closest to the tree and down lower where it's, getting the most humid um, environment. So you look for those so that you know when, if it's there and when it starts to become active. If you are growing plants that are tight together or you have a tree canopy that's very thick and lush and full, then you can thin the plants or thin the canopy to get good airflow. Uh, so for fungicide options, if needed, um, the timing is that first time that you see infection. So again, it could be right when leaves come out, it could be a month later. So you just would need to watch um, and then repeat as needed based on the labels recommendation for uh, when you can reapply. Uh, so there are some products that would be considered preventive and most of those are organic. And when I say preventive, it means that they uh, need to be, the product needs to be on the foliage before the powdery mildew spores land on the foliage. So it's preventive. It doesn't really work after you see a lot of powdery mildew. So here we have some examples here is potassium bicarbonate. And one example is Calagreen. And that's okay, but research has shown that uh, you can mix it with about a half percent of horticultural oil, and there's lots of brands of horticultural oil. So that would be one option, or even oil alone, horticultural oil, neem oil at about 1% regularly. By regularly, I mean every five days has been shown to be pretty effective against powdery mildew. Um, and then there's the old standby, which is sulfur, which is um, also organic and would need to be applied about every seven days. So one comment I wanna make here about these uh, three options, I have two that have oil and then I listed sulfur. So I just wanna make sure that you know that you should never apply sulfur within two weeks of an oil application. It will just damage the foliage. Um, and then there's some products that are preventive um, and curative. So if you have a horrible um, infection of powdery mildew that you just weren't able to get to, then you might wanna consider a stronger fungicide. So there's lots and lots of commercial um, brands available. I listed a couple here, Banner Max, Heritage or Eagle. Um, and then for residential, I've listed some there as well. And again, I am recording this and we'll post it so that you can see this information later. Okay, scale insects is another one that you would probably wanna consider managing rather than just letting it go. Um, so for scales, it can be grouped into two different types and there's several species within each type. So we have soft scales, and they have a rounded body shown in this picture. And that 
rounded uh, body there is it is all one. It's attached to the body. And then there's armored scales. And the armored scales are actually a very soft insect, but as they molt, um, their exoskeleton, which is waxy and with other uh, uh, characteristics, is attached to the body. And so they have like this armor over their body. And in this picture on the lower right, I've kind of detached that armored covering uh, off of the scale body. So that's what makes armored scales a little more difficult to manage. So I think with the Q&A, what I'll do is I'll address all those questions at the end. All right, so with soft scales, why would you manage them? Well, uh, the tree can become weakened over time. And some of these insects actually do or can kill trees, um, but it could predispose the the plant to other problems. Uh, so the, for the soft scales, um, just quickly about its life cycle. Uh, so here's the, that same image. So there's the body of the scale. And so what I've done with this image here is I've popped that scale off the surface of the plant that it's on. And all this under here are the eggs. So it overwinters uh, as on the plant as adults or nymphs. And then in the spring, the eggs form under the female's body. And then those eggs will hatch and they'll be called crawlers. And the crawlers will then often move onto the foliage shown in this lower picture and feed there for much of the summer and then move back to twigs for the rest of their, their lives. So they don't move around too, too much. Um, but the soft scales, as they feed, they are creating a lot of honeydew. And here are just two examples of different scale species on the left and on the right. A picture on the right is hard to even see the individual bodies because they're piled on top of each other. But you can see um, what looks like water droplets off to the right. And so that's the honeydew being produced by the scales. So the soft scales don't tend to kill trees, but they certain, certainly weaken them over time. And it might have some dieback and dead limbs. All right, and then armored scales. Uh, some examples here on the top is black pine leaf scale. On the lower left is called oyster shell scale. And on the lower right is San Jose scale. So what's different about these is that they'll still overwinter the same way. The females will produce the eggs under her body. And then when the crawlers hatch, they don't tend to move very far at all. And that's why you'll have these huge populations um, of uh, scales very clustered together. Um, and they also do not produce honeydew, like I showed you with the soft scales. Um, but the armored scales, again, because they have that armor, they're less affected by natural biological control, like our predators and parasitoids that just occur naturally. Um, and so as a result, they can kill plants if left alone. So as far as management goes, um, you can encourage some natural biocontrol, especially for those soft scales, by adding flowering plantings. A lot of our natural enemies need pollen and nectar, so that will bring them into your area. And um, trees that are under stress are going to be um, more heavily affected by scales. So scales can attack healthy trees, but the populations will grow exponentially on trees that are under stress. So good watering. Um, and then if needed, so there's a couple of timings that you would wanna treat scale. So the first is it's for the most part in a lot of the areas where you guys it's passed, it's the dormant oil application. So that would be when the buds are just starting to swell on your tree or shrub. And um, the oil would be at about 2% concentration. And just to, so you know, it's good to know if you're treating soft scales or armored scales because the dormant oil is not 
100% effective on armored scales. A lot of those will survive that oil application. And, um, and therefore, so an additional application may be needed. So uh, sometimes it's just easiest to go the route of the systemic uh, application, a soil injection or a drench. And um, the timing would be early to mid spring, but I do have a caveat here that these should not be used on plants that are pollinated by bees because these systemics can move into the pollen. But if it's not, if it's when pollinated or some other method, then you can use this a systemic. Uh, so we have a couple of options that I've listed here. Denotefuran is good for armored scales and that's Safari. And then Imidacloprid for soft scales. And there's several brands of that that are available for both commercial and residential. And then um, I'm still on the pest to manage. So we have spider mites, okay? Um, so spider mites are tiny, tiny arachnids that if you're like me, you can't really see them with the naked eye. You need a, a magnifying lens. Um, they are mostly an issue in really hot, dry, dusty conditions. Uh, so two of our more common ones is two-spotted spider mite, which has a host of hundreds of species, and honey locust spider mite, which is um, spe spe specific to honey locust, and then spruce spider mite, which actually is a cool season mite. So I'll show you some pictures of those. But as for why you would manage these, well, it prevents photosynthesis. There's um, plants that are affected will have early leaf drop in the fall. So that may reduce their cold hardiness. So spider mites can definitely have an effect on plants over the long term. So I mentioned the two spotted spider mites that's shown on the left. Very easy to identify, again, if you're looking at it with uh, magnifying lens. And then honey locust mite, again, is specific to honey locusts. And the symptoms of the spider mites on the broadleaf trees is this classic uh, symptom shown here that we call stippling. So it's like a paintbrush has been splattered onto the foliage of a yellow color. So the, the uh, spider mites, as they feed, mostly on the undersides of the leaves, they're pulling out the chlorophyll. And spider mites can also affect some of our uh, evergreens like juniper. So this is uh, spider mite damage to juniper. And then I mentioned the cool season mite, the spruce spider mite is, um, causes similar looking symptoms that stippling damage, but they're going to be active in the spring and the fall. So during the summer, they're mostly in a dormant stage as eggs. All right, so managing these uh, arachnids is first off identifying, are they there and which species is it? So you can monitor pretty easily by taking a piece of even a white paper, a piece of cardboard or a cloth, and then you shake a branch over that paper and the mites will fall onto the paper and they'll look like tiny little dots of dirt. Um, but if you smear across one of those dots and it makes it leaves a line, you know that that was a spider mite. And they move pretty slowly on, on the foliage and on the paper. But um, for non-chemical prevention is, um, here we go again, preventing drought stress on the plants. Plants that are under drought stress are much more susceptible than plants that aren't. Um, and also prevent buildup of dust. So that again, that's gonna kind of reduce that spider mite uh, incidence. And then as far as chemical goes, um, if you are treating your, your plant for some kind of pest in the spring and you use a broad spectrum insecticide, that will kill our natural enemies, especially the predatory mites, which tend to be out early in the season. And so if that application is made, there may be a 
a problem of spider mite buildup later in the season. So try and avoid that. Um, but if needs it needs to be treated, definitely look for a miticide, um, not some uh, broad spectrum type insecticide. And a lot of these I listed here are commercially commercial application products. For residential, then that would be something uh, very basic like horticultural oil. And you'd want to put it on at a, a low rate, um, a half percent to 1%. All right, so now I'm going to cover those pests to ignore. Um, but maybe what I will do actually is look at these questions that you guys have already asked in the Q&A and maybe take care of some of those. Let's see. All right. So now I'm going to move on to um, tree pests to ignore. And we will start with aphids. And so we often get questions about aphids. And so you may wonder, why would you just ignore them? Because they, they're such a common pest. Um, and again, this goes back to really a, a maybe a personal decision and the fact that they're cyclical. Um, but as you know, aphids, they can be kind of a nuisance because they do create all this honeydew as they feed with that piercing, sucking mouth part. Um, but one of the, some of the reasons why I'm thinking ignore aphids are, well, there's um, many of our aphid species, especially I'm talking about on trees, are only around for a few weeks in the spring. And then they actually migrate away from the trees to go to alternate hosts for the summer. So that's one reason um, plants can actually withstand um, somewhat low to moderate populations. Even though it may bother us, the plant can still, uh, it's not affected. The vigor is not reduced. Um, and also think about the aphids are serving as prey for a lot of our beneficial um, predators and parasitoids. And so leaving the aphids in place is gonna help build up that population. And then you'll have that on that property for years to come. But if um, you, know, you feel like, well, I, I definitely wanna take care of my aphids, there are some options. Of course, there's that dormant timing. Um, and again, this may have passed for most of you, but it's when the buds swell and the leaves just start emerging. So the very simple application is that horticultural oil at 2%. And what that's doing is it's smothering um, the aphid eggs. So these aphids are overwintering as eggs on the trees. And then if you still see aphids or need to do something later in the season, then um, you can use that same oil product at a lower rate um, or insecticidal soap. And there's several brands of soap and I recommend purchasing an insecticidal soap that has a label for insects. Um, let's see, a comment here about these two is that they need to come into contact with the aphids. And a lot of the aphids are on the undersides of the leaves. So the spray would really need to kind of just cover the leaves themselves. I will back up and say, I've had some situations where I've got small trees that were really infested with aphids. And so I just tried using um, what uh, other people have recommended, which is a strong stream of water and spray those leaves. And I did it once and didn't do much, but I kept doing it about every four days. And after a couple of weeks, they were gone. So once those trees got big though, then that, <laughs> jet spray of water was really impossible to keep up with. Um, so anyway, a small plant, that could be your option too. Conventional options could be, um, are shown here. And again, those last two I've mentioned, imidacloprid, safari are systemics. So do not use them on any plants pollinated by bees. So there is a question that I will go, will go ahead and address in chat. Um, is it safe to spray dormant oil on Eastern red bud after bud break or after flowering? For, uh, let's see, armored scales on your red bud. Um, so you can spray oil on your red bud. Again, if the leaves are out, you wanna reduce the, the rate to that 1% that I've mentioned. So that's 
two and a half tablespoons per gallon is 1%. So um, if you, for red buds, if you spray it too early with oil, I do not have any knowledge that it would affect the flowering. If you spray the oil during flowering, that would probably not be good and cause the flowers to drop. All right, leaf spots is another one that for Utah, something that can probably be ignored, um, except for one example that I'll mention. So a lot of our uh, trees can get leaf spot diseases, but again, we rarely see them. Um, leaf spot pathogens um, require, usually I've said here, high humidity. So, um, you know, our relative humidity in Utah is so low that it does prevent a lot of that spread. And most leaf spot diseases cause infection in the spring. After spring, they are done. One example of one that you may need to be uh, managed is on the top left, the aspen leaf spot, which seems to be something that affects a lot of our aspens that people have planted in ornamental areas. Um, but these, the other two pictures are just examples of some other leaf spot diseases. So if uh, a management is needed, um, the fungi overwinter on fallen leaves. So raking and removing those leaves will somewhat help to reduce the population and then thin the trees or um, clumps to get good air circulation. Make sure your sprinkler irrigation, uh, if it is a sprinkler, is not wetting the foliage um, from trees, shrubs, down to your perennials, because that will contribute to, to spread. And then finally, I've listed, you know, this is really just if needed, some chemical options. The timing would be at bud break, and then you would repeat it 10 days later. So there's lots, just like I mentioned with powdery mildew, there's lots of commercial fungicides out there. And for residential fungicides, um, the, the listing I've shown here is, um, for the most part, they're not going to uh, affect pollinators if you're not applying it to any flowering plants. So once it's dried on the foliage, the, it won't affect poll our pollinators. All right, so another one for ignoring is bacterial blight. And this is somewhat rare, so you actually may never have even seen this uh, causing disease, but so bacterial blight is caused by a very, very common bacteria called Pseudomonas. It exists almost everywhere, and it's just surviving on surfaces from what it needs from the atmosphere. Um, but it may cause infection under uh, the right conditions. So there's several woody host plants that can be affected by bacterial blight from maple to aspen, lilac, linden. Um, it causes a shoot and flower blight. And the reason why, I'll show you some pictures of it, but the reason why um, this can be ignored is because um, the infections happen in the spring under very cool and wet conditions. So prolonged, meaning like weeks um, of these conditions where the temperatures are below in the 50s or below and, and again with that wet weather. Um, and then it stops as soon as temperatures get about 70 and, and the air dries out. And also these infections can be pruned out and then it's gone. So the bacteria um, cause what looks like frost damage. They, um, they're able to kill the tissue in advance and then they feed on the tissue uh, causing these wilted shoots. So it's really just these kind of terminal five or so leaves of a particular shoot that get killed and, and that can be pruned off as soon as the temperature's warm. Um, I'm gonna, this is being recorded. So I'm going to go through some of these a little bit more quickly. Um, but with bacterial blight, again, you can prune out those infections on a sunny, warm day. Um, and also make sure that 
wherever you're doing your normal pruning, um, do it in the winter time when the trees are fully dormant rather than, um, let me back up. When you're doing your pruning of uh, trees that are not quite as hardy, um, make sure to do it when uh, there's no threat of severe cold temperatures right after pruning. And that would cause cold injury, which may lead to increased susceptibility of damage. Um, and then where this disease does occur more often than the application of copper and uh, right before bud break is what people use. So I wanted to add in this particular disease because I do get questions about conifers a lot where the needles are turning brown and they're not doing well. So I wanted to mention this disease of conifers called needle cast. And needle cast disease of conifers just means foliar disease. And the, the needle cast part is that means that these needles actually drop from the tree. Uh, but it can be a severe disease in some of our mountainous areas where it has uh, really spread quite rapidly, especially in areas where they're in, um, drainages where there's a little more, more humid, more rainfall, um, but we can ignore it for our residential areas of Utah, because this is another one that needs cool, wet temperatures. And it's not in the springtime though, not in that early spring, it's in the late spring to summer. And we rarely have cool, wet temperatures during the summer. In fact, I have never, I've been here 15 years and have never identified needle cast disease on any conifer. So it's very rare. But I do wanna point out what you would look for and what the characteristics of needle cast diseases are. Um, so the infections happen in the summertime, not in the spring like other diseases. Symptoms start on the lower branches and they work their way up. Again, when we think about the humidity level, it's gonna be highest in that area. And when you see a tree that may be affected by needle cast disease, it's usually the um, second year needles that have the symptoms and the first year needles, if candles, if they've already been, uh, needles have already emerged, will be green. So that's shown in this bottom picture. And then finally, if you're not sure, that you take one of those dead needles grab your magnifying lens or your hand lens and look for what are called fruiting bodies. And that's the actual sign of the fungus itself. So on this lower picture, all these little dots are the fungal fruiting bodies erupting through the stomates. So they may take on uh, various shapes or colors. Let me back up to this picture on the left these little black areas on these dead leaves of this is a logical pine uh, is another um, type of fruiting body. So sometimes they are visible to the naked eye. But with a lot of the conifer issues that we have in Utah, it's abiotic. And it seems to be mostly with our spruces. And if you're not aware, the reason is because our, um, Colorado blue spruce and a lot of other spruces are extremely shallow rooted. Shown in this picture on the right, you see this entire root ball is really just a few inches deep. And as a result, any kind of um, change to the soil surface, like compaction, um, any cultivation, temperature extremes, moisture extremes, is really going to have an effect on the tree because it's the roots are just right there on the surface. And so anyway, that's what a lot of what we see on conifers is abiotic. So another uh, pest that could be ignored is uh, leaf curl diseases. And in Utah, we have two, at least two. One that affects peaches and nectarine, shown on the left. And then one that affects oak trees, shown on the right. They're both caused by a fungus called tephrina. But it can be ignored because it's another uh, cyclical thing. It needs cool, wet temperatures during the spring 
Um, and so I really only see these diseases every few years, but the infections only happen in the spring when uh, conditions dry up, it's done. And a lot of those leaves drop and a new flush of foliage will replace those few leaves on the trees that have been affected. So this is one not to worry about. Um, and then caterpillars as well. We have dozens of caterpillar species that feed on our foliage. Um, go back to think about the whole cyclical thing. You know, this is not all of them to be ignored, but most of them are really, you may see them, but they're really not gonna be that big of a deal on our ornamental landscape plants. Um, some of them just have one generation and they're only around for about six weeks. And the trees uh, early in the season, if they're affected, they'll put out a new flush of growth. And like I said, those populations vary from year to year. If there is, if there are cases where there is an infestation and these need to be treated, the best option, it's organic, is to use what's called BT, which is Bacillus thuringiensis. And I've listed Dipel, Zentari, those are commercial options, but there's um, a whole host of residential products that have BT. So the caveat with using BT is that you have to be on top of it early. It must be, well, it's most effective um, when applied where the larvae are still about a half inch in size or less. Applied any later than that, then uh, it won't be as effective because they, the caterpillars need to consume the BT in order for it to work. All right, I think this might be the last for the uh, pest to ignore and that's plant bugs. And I know there was a question in Q&A for plant bugs and I will get to that. Um, so there's a few trees that are affected by plant bugs, honey locust, ash and sycamore in Utah. And um, to ignore these, the damage is usually minor. However, I do have a caveat here that sycamore plant bug, we are seeing that it can cause more damage um, than some of these others. And the reason is that the honey locust plant bug and the ash plant bug only have one generation per year. So they're just around uh, for about eight weeks in the spring, whereas the sycamore plant bug has multiple generations. And so it's around all summer long. So you wanna make sure that the sycamore plant bug is actually what's causing the damage. So you can shake a branch over a tray in early spring. That's when these guys start to become active. And for managing them, um, you could use that dormant oil spray, horticultural oil or insecticidal soap after bud break. So as soon as the leaves um, are about halfway expanded or so is when you wanna make that application. And that's those newly emerged nymphs that you're targeting. Otherwise, there's lots of, I would recommend a broad spectrum insecticide. Um, and again, you wanna apply it in the evening just to make sure there's no flowering plants around the area where the application is being made. And certainly on a sycamore tree, you probably wanna bring in a professional and have them make the application. So finally, I'll just finish up with uh, tree pests that are quote, impossible to fix. And this list here of five different pests, if you are familiar with them, you'll see that they're all caused by uh, fungal pathogens or, or uh, related. So they're not insect caused pests, okay? So we'll start with bacterial wetwood and uh, if you think about our soils, there's thousands and thousands of organisms that live in the soil. And some of them are bacteria, and shown here are examples of three species. And these are ubiquitous in our soils, but with some tree hosts, like those listed here, they're just uh, susceptible to um, being invaded by those bacteria up into the tree itself. So the root system, is where this infection happens. Bacteria enter the roots and colonize the um, xylem of the tree itself. And with um, what we call slime flux, um, where it's shown in the picture here, 
the trees are not killed. They may be um, bigger, maybe reduced. And so what happens there is that the bacteria in the tree start to ferment, pressure builds, and that bacteria needs some way to escape the tree from that pressure. And it usually comes out in a pruning cut or some other wound in the tree. Um, so this picture is showing the bacteria oozing out, but also there's other bacteria and organisms that colonize what's coming out of the tree. And so this ooze is actually quite toxic. Um, go to the next picture here. And as it drips down, it actually kills the uh, whatever is growing down beneath that slime flux oozing out. So let me go back to this slide. Why is it impossible to cure? Well, because the infections happen through the roots and the wood is infected or the xylem. There are some cases though with this disease, bacterial wet wood, that's not, it goes beyond what we call slime flux. It actually uh, can kill trees. And we've really only seen this on cottonwoods and some poplars. Uh, the bacteria still work the same way, still the same species. They're still, it's still coming in through the roots, colonizing the tree. Um, but on the bark, it's a little different symptoms where we get these areas of ooze that are almost a dime or quarter size on the bark itself, um, where the bacteria is just trying to, to get out from the tree. And then scraping away the bark under those areas of ooze and, and the tissue underneath is completely dead. Um, and typically you don't see that with slime flux. The tissue is also dead into the xylem itself. So the phloem and the xylem are being killed. Uh, let me back up. I wanted to make one more comment about this is that the damage is also happening in areas of highly compacted soil. Um, sometimes there may, it may be near a water source or the trees may be um, growing close to each other and the bacteria is spreading with root to root contact. So with bacterial wet wood management, um, in particular slime flux, drain tubes are not recommended. So with slime flux, don't put on a drain tube. Um, you can um, clean around the bark area, but don't scrape uh, the wood away from that oozing area. Any loose bark or dead bark or dead limbs, those can be pruned out and just, you know, in general, keeping the, the tree healthy. So unfortunately with bacterial wet wood, where I showed the trees being killed and even slime flux, it's really prevention. So again, there's nothing you can do to fix it. Good pruning practices um, prevent wounding the roots. So if you're out mowing and you have some surface roots and of a cottonwood, elm, you know, willow, one of these susceptible trees, don't go mowing over those roots all the time because that's going to cause wounds that may contribute to this from happening, bacterial wet wood. Um, prevent soil compaction. So putting some mulch down to protect those roots, keep the soil nice and loose would be a good idea. And good, uh, don't, allow the trees to be under drought stress. Cankers is another one I wanted to mention that once a canker is there, it uh, cannot be cured with any kind of fung fungicide treatment. So what a canker is, it's a localized area of uh, bark tissue and cambium tissue that's killed by a fungus or a pathogen. So in this picture, I've scraped the bark away and showed all the dead tissue that's been killed by a fungus. There are hundreds of posts that can get uh, what's called a canker and a lot of different uh, pathogens cause cankers. So the word canker is kind of a general term. Impossible to treat because then the infections occur through wounds, pruning cuts, and it's inside the tree, inside the bark and phloem. So there, we don't have any fungicides that can target those areas. But for cankers, just to look for, you know, how to identify, do you have a canker? Look for discolored bark tissue. Is there, are there any areas where there's sunken bark and it might be associated with a dead branch? 
or the bark may be cracking, flaking, um, or there may be some oozing or pitching um, of sap from the bark. And that's the tree's way of trying to fight off the canker. And that oozing will be, again, delineated by the specific area of the canker. So if you're not sure, another way to tell is to scrape the bark away just to the phloem, so don't go too deep, with a sharp knife. And on the picture on the left, I've scraped um, a little bit of bark away into the uh, phloem tissue and the brown area has been killed by the pathogen. And you can see that's the line of its growth. And same with the two pictures on the right. So with managing cankers, it's more about prevention. And a lot of the cankers that we see happening are from um, pruning cuts. So all canker pathogens need to enter through a wound and a pruning, a poor pruning cut is one of the primary entry molds. So what I mean by that is a stub cut. So leaving this little extra bit of wood rather than doing a nice cut into the tree could be where a canker path pathogen may enter. But then you also, um, so I mentioned impossible to cure. Well, you can cure it by actually cutting out the canker from the tree. It's gone, it's, it's done. Um, but there's nothing you can do to protect or, or save that branch. So I did wanna talk about if you are pruning out a canker. So you wanna find the edge of the bottom edge of that infected tissue and uh, so that you know how far down to prune. So ideally remove that entire diseased area and make sure if you can to prune anywhere from four to 12 inches beyond that canker margin into healthy wood. And if you have made a pruning cut and a year later you see that um, it didn't heal over, you didn't callus over, or maybe there's some oozing still happening on that cut, then you know you probably cut right through the, the canker and it's just kept moving into the rest of the tree or the branch. All right, so another impossible to treat issue is just general decay in trees. So whenever a tree has a wound to natural causes, um, some fungi may enter into that wound and feed on dead wood, not living wood, and it causes decay. And the decay then is um, not structurally sound. So the tree becomes very weak. Um, so you may notice decay if there's loose bark, um, if you have an abnormal swelling around the base of the tree, if you see some fungal fruiting structure, so that's called a conch growing from the side of the tree. Um, stump sprouts elsewhere beyond the tree may indicate decay, um, cavities, et cetera. So, ways to look for decay in trees. And of course, decay is very um, advanced stage. So once it's visible, the fungus has colonized a majority of the wood. Um, so just some examples of where decay could enter a tree or what might um, be signs to look for possible uh, issues where decay might be there is an old um, frost crack shown on the left where um, the wood, the tree calloused over, but there's still uh, exposed wood inside the tree. And as you know, wood in tree is not living. And so it can be colonized. Um, old injuries at the base of the tree from pond mowers or even an old um, uh, uh, strike from uh, lightning onto a tree can cause damage, a wound, and there could be in, uh, decay entry in. So a particularly serious disease of trees is called Phytophthora crown and root rot. And um, again, it's not one that, unfortunately, once a tree is infected, it's gonna die. So there's, this is another uh, organism that's in our soils almost ubiquitously and is only gonna cause infection under the right conditions. And we have a lot of different hosts in Utah that are susceptible and um, maple, cherries, sumac, even junipers and some of our uh, evergreens are susceptible. 
So it's impossible to fix. Um, again, in, infections occur through the roots or the crown and it's inside the tree and it kills the tree very quickly. So I mentioned this is one that um, causes infection only under the right circumstances and that those circumstances are saturated soils. So this top picture where you have uh, this poor tree just sitting in um, the irrigation water for the turf uh, is probably very poorly drained. So where the, where the soil has been saturated for um, eight hours or more, then there's a possibility of infection if it's the right host. So the reason the soil needs to be saturated is shown on the left, the, this particular pathogen forms spores that need to swim to find their host. So these, some fungal spores you think of being in the air, well, these are in the soil and they're swimming, so they need that water. Um, another or incidents where infection might happen is if you have a susceptible host that is drought tolerant, like junipers in the lower left picture, um, but it's growing in an, right next to turf. And so it's getting the same amount of water as the turf is getting, uh, thus leading to conditions conducive to infection. And then clay-like soils where you have very poor drainage um, can also provide just enough of that saturated conditions for infection. So again, trees can die very quickly within a matter of a few weeks from infection. And you can also see if you have trees of the same species that it can spread from one tree to the next through primarily root to root contact. That's indicative of Phytophthora. Um, if you're not sure, kind of like with the cankers, you can look at the tissue underneath the bark. So it's gonna be at the base of the tree only a couple of inches up, scrape the bark away, and you can see that dead cinnamon brown colored tissue. So the pathogen is essentially girdling uh, the tree. For dealing with Phytophthora, it's, it's again all about prevention, um, but you would wanna look for the wilting or off colored foliage in the summertime, um, or maybe the plant is leafing out late in the spring later than what you normally would expect, or it's turning color early in the fall. So all that's are signs of the tree is definitely not doing too well. Um, to prevent, avoid saturating the roots in the trunk. Um, making sure the soil is well-drained is important. And if the tree does, uh, has been identified as having Phytophthora, it should be removed. Uh, you can replant in that spot, but it, you should replant with a um, non-susceptible species. And I've listed some for you below. Finally, the last topic of this webinar is verticillium wilt. Uh, one that, another one, nothing that you can do about it. It's another one that affects the wood of the tree and infections happen through the roots. So, Thus, there's no uh, cures for verticillium wilt. Um, it's another one where the pathogen uh, can occur in our soils. It's not everywhere, it's, um, but it's long lived. It can live for seven years or more in the soil. So if you have the right host, um, maples are one of our common hosts that um, infection can happen through the roots. And you see the staining that's happening in the water conducting tissues. So it's a wilt. So the fungus is actually clogging those water conducting tissues and the trees die pretty quickly. And this is another example. This is a ornamental plum shown on the left uh, with showing the early signs of wilt. And then once the tree was removed, we could see the discoloration by scraping the into like whittling away the wood and seeing that discoloration. So, with this disease, you can't, unfortunately, nothing you can do about the tree itself. Eventually it will die. Um, and so removal is what you would wanna do. And like the Phytophthora, you can replant in that same spot, but you wanna replant with uh, a resistant species. And there are some that are not affected by verticillium. So that ends this webinar. Uh, thank you very much.